Well, I think we'll start this evening. Um, I want to welcome you all tonight to uh, the Art in the Library programming program featuring uh, Richard Bruns. I'm Stephana Pramick. I'm a member of the staff at the Napa County Library. And while I miss meeting with you in person, I'm really glad to have this opportunity to meet with you virtually. Um, Richard's beautifully curated exhibition was displayed in our library in this past March. And however, due to the shelter in place orders in mid-March, our library closed and thus Richard's uh, work was also, his exhibition also ended. However, Richard fortunately uh, agreed to be our first virtual Art in the Library guest speaker. And tonight he brings his show to you. Richard Bruns has enjoyed a professional career that has entwined writing, publishing, and photography. He enjoys capturing events of all kinds. He's skilled in photojournalism and documentary photography. His work also includes wildlife photography and nature scenes. And it is my great pleasure to introduce to you tonight, Richard Bruns. Richard? Hey, thanks very much. Uh, I've got a little uh, thank yous here, housekeeping to do before we really get going. Uh, I'm thanking Stephanie and Katie and Helene of the Napa County Library for all of the, they've done to make this happen. And for Stephania again for organizing this Zoom thing. Uh, I want to thank Betty Mongren, uh, Eddie, who is an editor and publisher of English Time, English, Easy English Times. She's my former boss at Napa Valley College, and I learned a ton from her. And Ron Rogers, um, former director of the Napa Valley Photography Program. He was one of my instructors and my Mac guru keeps it running. Uh, Allison Nature Alley Sheehy, currently of Sequoia Forest Keepers and master photographer of nature who got me hooked on other kinds of critters than birds. And Samanda Dorger, former Napa Valley Register photographer and former Napa Valley photojournalism instructor. I learned how to shoot and build the story from her. Uh, she had just come back from the Indonesian uh, tsunami disaster, and the photos she showed were mind-blowingly horrible uh, in this content, but great in the execution. And most importantly, I want to thank my wife, Judy, for her incredible patience with weekend deadline and assignments. Uh, my general theme is quantified by a man named Dan Millman. He wrote a book called The Peaceful Warrior and a movie uh, made from that book. And this quote is, there is never nothing going on. There are no ordinary moments. There's always something to shoot. And by that, you have to take your camera to shoot it. And one of the first things I learned was that if I forgot my camera, I don't get to take that picture. So that camera goes everywhere I go. And having your camera, you still want to make sure that your batteries are charged. Another basic that I have often messed up, uh, I take a little screwdriver because these little, I'm pointing at it and you can't see me point. Uh, these little screws and the lenses and the cameras can come loose and it messes up with your focus. So take that with you if you go shooting. And finally, keep your camera parts clean. Otherwise, you don't have to clean your photo after you've taken it, as exemplified here, I hope. And truth to tell, I've been really lucky about my job. Uh, working at Napa Valley College gave me all kinds of opportunities to shoot different things, sports, police scenarios for the police academy, now, the interesting thing to me is this man is the same man. On the far left, he's a student at the Academy of, in Police Work. Uh, in 2009, there was a robbery in South uh, Shopping Center that the bad guy came over to the campus and we got closed down. 
and he was there with his handy trusty AK-47 to make sure I didn't get in to cover the story. Uh, the photo on the right was taken about a week and a half ago at a demonstration downtown. Uh, same man uh, standing with the new chief of police, Robert Plummer, who's a pretty decent guy. Uh, photos at the college included Larry, who was there for a couple of years. What's that? And a lot of sports. This photo was shot on campus. It's the California Poppy, and it was the cover of one of the class schedules. Uh, this is a photo of Super Bowl winning coach Dick Vermillion. He was entered into the Napa Valley College Athletic Hall of Fame. Uh, a program started by Kevin Lucky, and since he's retired, it's kind of disappeared, which is a shame. Uh, here's a photo of Glenn Bell. Glenn Bell started the original police academy program out at the college. He was a San Francisco officer. He moved to, uh, I think it was Novato, and became an officer there, and got tired of police work and became a teacher. Uh, he volunteered to be a pie target. National Pie Day is, celebrates the mathematical formula for pi, which you see here goes to 100 digits. Pi Day is on March 14th, 3.14 being the, three, the beginning of the pi number. This photo was taken on the college campus. It actually won a first prize in a, in a county fair up in Lake County. Uh, I call it thistle uh, for obvious reasons rather than ladybug. Uh, this was also taken on the campus. Uh, Sunset Ducks uh, College has a duck pond that few people seem to know about but has a rich variety of birds and wildlife that can be used for targeting, uh, photo targeting. Same pond, in the top left, you see a night, black crowned night heron, and on the log, you get to see four pond turtles. They are very shy and very difficult to photograph. Uh, I got real lucky with this one. Uh, a nice little Heron on the college pond again. And the exhibit, some, a selection of the ones that were hung up there. I have a question about whether I do fine art. I, I don't know what fine art is. I shoot and I try to do the best I can with the shot and whether it's fine art or documentary or what, I let other people kind of work with that. This was uh, at the Napa Town and Country Fair about 10 years ago. These young dancers represented one of the private clubs in town. And I was struck by the, the red flowing dresses in the wind. And they were just having such a wonderful time. I couldn't resist shooting a bunch of shots. This was at uh, Clear Lake, no. Uh, Lakeport, I have that mislabeled. Lakeport, a fella taking uh, fishing on the lake. I don't know if he caught anything, but this was early in the morning, as you can probably tell by the orange light. This is a natural shot. I have not tinkered with that, except it contrasts it just a little bit higher. The lighting just struck, uh, it was incredible. This uh, is a fisherman, one of the few remaining fishermen, a commercial fisherman uh, on the coast. This is Noyo Harbor in Fort Bragg. And he'd just come in with a catch of sea urchins. Uh, this is a photo of the photo. That's why we get that glare on there. Uh, I didn't have time to process, reprocess the other photo for, for insertion here. This is either Hunter or Sox. I can't tell them apart. They belong to my grandchildren. Uh, they weigh about 20 pounds each. 
and I, he's a pretty curious fellow. He came right up and let me take his picture. I like hawks. This is a hawk in flight. Uh, he didn't like me taking his picture, if it's a he, and took, took off, and I followed it with a number of shots on a setting called burst. These were the three best. That's a close up of the, the one that was hanging in the library. It's a handsome fellow, if a fellow. I think, and I'm not sure, I think this may be a Cooper's hawk. I'm not good at identifying hawks. They all look pretty much the same to me, but the, the little ring around his neck suggests that it's a Cooper's hawk, I believe. A red tail hawk. This uh, nice looking bird hangs out at Kennedy Park. You know those two uh, tall radio antennas? You can go out there and find it out there just about any day. The great blue heron out at Lake Hennessy. I had a brand new lens and I was testing it out and this is very early in the morning around about January 1st or December 20, uh, 30, somewhere around there. Um, he's cold and that's frost on the grass there, but it was a beautiful morning. I am a turkey vulture fan and this is a turkey vulture that got startled by a tourist coming up with his point and shoot while I was creeping up on him to get a nice shot. He scared him away and I got an even better shot. They weigh about a pound. They are extraordinarily useful. Uh, they prevent disease by eating the carrion that is around. And the reason he's here is because this forest canopy in the background uh, is Kern River Preserve, an Audubon sponsored society. They lay under the migration path of turkey vultures from the northwest part of the continent down to Central America. They migrate by the thousands and they drop down into this forest canopy. So for a while they had a turkey vulture festival <laughs> which uh, I discovered and started going to and volunteering for at times. And they, these are some that are getting ready to take off the next morning. They're youngsters and you can tell that because their heads are still black. Most of you who know about turkey vultures will recognize them by their red head. If they have a red head, they're older than a year. If they have black head or transitioning to black, uh, from black to red, uh, they are a year or a year and a half and just passing that, that landmark, it's a curious thing. They sit on the tree branches like this and fence posts to warm their wings. They are very weak in both leg and wing. So they dry them off from the night's dew and well, when they're ready to go, they'll lift off and begin their, continue their, uh, their migration path. I also like any bird. Uh, I was camping on the West Coast and discovered these pelicans going by within, what, 30 meters, 20 meters. And getting these kinds of shots became kind of uh, easy. Uh, I like the three-dimensional aspect of it with the sea under, underneath and the fact that they're eye level. They're very close. Uh, Robin having lunch. This was taken out by Napa River, uh, you know, where the yacht club is out there, the, down on Riverside Drive. He was just grabbing himself a cricket there and getting ready to have lunch and a bumblebee sort of critter with pollen all over him, it. This gull was taken in Yosemite, uh, coming in over near Mount Dana on, I think that's one, Highway 120. Uh, there are a couple of lakes about 9,000 feet high and they're full of gulls. And I've got this one just sort of mid-flap, 
It was wonderful, I thought. Uh, my friend Allie, when I visit with her down in uh, Kern County, takes me in all kinds of secret places. Uh, these ladybugs have some sort of a nest, and there's actually hundreds of them there. And I got this the ones that are on top of the log. I do a little manipulation with uh, Photoshop. And this is either Hunter or Sox trying to get out. I call it Schrodinger's cat. Uh, if you know the story of Schrodinger, you might find it amusing. Uh, Schrodinger was a physicist, a, a theoretical physicist who posited a famous mind problem called Schrodinger's cat, which I won't go into. I'll let you look it up because it'll take too long to explain. Uh, out at Yosemite again, whole herd of these handsome critters. I watched them for about three hours. People would stop, get their point and shoots, take their pictures. I'd take pictures of them taking pictures. Then I'd go back to taking pictures of these fellows. Now this critter is a grass spider. It's on the shore of the lake Salt Lake in Utah. Uh, I stopped to visit a, an interesting building there and saw this hanging from a sign probably 30 feet away. He was that big. And I put a red background because it shows up his uh, kind of the transparency of his legs and the color markings a lot better than just a normal photograph. Uh, we were doing a trip, Allie and I, to uh, the coast, and we saw huge spider webs, uh, two and three and four feet across, that were bedecked by dew from the morning or from the evening before, and we had to stop to take a couple of shots. That's the same spider web from a different angle. And this spider web was... Uh, out at Kennedy Park. Those of you who know Kennedy Park, uh, where the boat launch is, just north of that is a huge patch of uh, reeds and weeds and grasses. And this was hanging in there one morning, a winter morning, uh, a few years ago, and I couldn't resist it. Uh, I don't know if you can see it, but I can see a reflection in the bigger drop in the center. Now, some of my photos, are stitched together. This was taken on uh, sol summer solstice three or four years ago at Kennedy Park. It's about, I have two of these and, and one is about nine photos and one is 11 photos stitched together in Photoshop. There's an algorithm in some of the programs that allow you to do that if you take your photos carefully enough that they can match up. You can see uh, the, the yeah, I hope you can see the uh, radio towers, which that red-tailed hawk likes to hang out on, and softball fields in the background. Uh, this is a seven, no, 11 photo composite that has two deer in them. Can you see them? Mm -hmm. There's one in the right, and there's one in the far left about a quarter of the way across from the left. The interesting thing to me is that the trail in Lassen National Park is about 150 feet away. And I like to leave the trail because I end up getting shots like this. We were listening, the three of us, to people, hikers going on the path that we I had just left. Uh, they didn't get to see the deer and I did. I'm sure they saw deer elsewhere, but this is kind of neat. This is an 11 photo stitch. Uh, I was coming back from my hometown in Colorado on Highway 50, which happens to go by Great Basin National Park. I'd never been there, I'd heard of it, and I stopped. The night that I shot this, I was told to go by a ranger to this location that was 9,000 feet high. I couldn't go any higher because snow was above that. This area had just been designated an international 
dark sky location, a special tribute to the darkness being preserved by intent. The ranger I talked to was responsible for having that happen. So it was serendipity for me uh, to ca catch him on that particular night. That bright object to the right, the brightest one, is Mars. And this photo spread is Sagittarius and Scorpio. And if I had a pointer and we were in the library, I could show you the stars and mark that out. Uh, nine photos here. This is uh, Eastern Sierras. Uh, I had lost my wallet and I'd stopped by the sheriff's department to see if someone had turned it in. They hadn't. I found it later in my truck. But while I was there, <coughs> pardon me, while I was there, I was struck by the magnificence of the clouds and the mountains and the foreground greenery. So I shot a bunch and put it together and got this. That's the basic program. Uh, I do a lot of breaking news kind of stuff. And one of them was the flood of 2005, 2006. We had three floods, major, probably considered floods of the century, 86, 97, and 2005, 2006. Remember that theater? Not so good anymore, it's gone. Mm -hmm. The whole area has been redesigned with the flood control program, which has been successful, I think. I like this one because it shows Vets Memorial Park before it got converted to what it is now. Uh, the water has already receded some, but man, that's a lot of water. We had uh, the governor come by, said he was going to promise his money. Uh, I believe this is Mr. Kreider of the city council, and I think that's Harold Moscowite. Is that uh, someone can maybe can confirm that? And Mayor Jill Teckel and councilwoman or supervisor, she may have been a councilwoman, and Diane Dillon and Bill Dodd. Now, these folks are a family. I love the expression of the two younger girls. What are we doing here? The girl in the middle has a notebook, so I figure she's doing a school report. Dad's checking me out, wondering what I'm doing. Mom's talking with the daughter. I think they're waiting to see the governor. And the governor is Governor Schwarzenegger. Uh, Dan Monez, chief of police at the time, also a media mogul. <laughs> so Schwartz there pontificates. He's doing a pretty good job, I think, at that time. Uh, Co Congressman Mike Thompson and Dylan, Diane Dillon uh, speaking to the news media. Now, he was leaving, and I wanted to try to get another photo, and I started running, and he saw me. And he stopped, although I still fuzz the photo. He was not one to miss a photo op. His handlers are not happy. But I got the shot. The thing about Schwarzenegger that impressed me is you've heard the phrase larger than life. When he walked up, man, he's larger than life. He's, he's a powerful force whether you like his politics or not, or his acting or not, uh, he enters the room, you know he's entered the room. This was the first Latino march in, uh, I think it was 2006, uh, on immigration. The police chief at the time, uh, was I don't think it was Dan Monez, uh, the police chief at the time liked to show a force. He had all his bikers there. And there was the potential for conflict. They marched. Well, this is, let me go back here. They marched for a bit and 
they ended up at City Hall as all marches seem to, and they talked to the mayor and the mayor talked to them and, and it was pretty equitable and, and uh, I think it was productive. Uh, Napa Valley Register in 2008 endorsed John McCain and Sarah Palin and the local Democrats were not happy with that. So they marched on the newspaper. Remember it was still down on uh, what, second, between second and third before the earthquake destroyed it. Harry Martin was <laughs> Our local gadfly, uh, an interesting news story in his own self, and he kept pace with the march as well. And then Bre Brenda Ellsmith, the publisher who wrote the opinion piece or the endorsement, defends it. And again, I was impressed with her coming out and having the courage to come out and talk with the people who ostensibly pretty hostile. Uh, they actually were very pleasant uh, and polite. Uh, I love photographing children. I start with my grandchildren. That's Aiden a few years ago, playing a game uh, of hockey, table hockey. That's my granddaughter. That's Kaylin. She's looking very angelic there. She's watching a TV program. And I just happen to catch her with that expression, and it just knocks me out. Aiden, getting a drink of water a year or so later. And Aiden, in his magical moments, uh, I'm pleased with this image that I created. It won first prize in uh, manipulated uh, art at the Town and Country Fair, uh, Fair a couple of years ago. These are my grandkids now. Aiden just graduated from high school uh, via virtual graduation. It was kind of strange to watch that. Kaylin is a ballet dancer and a charming young lady. I love taking pictures of children and their moms. You know, the, uh, the music program in the summer down at Betts Park, this young lady was getting down pretty good. These people, this mom and this daughter, uh, that's a son. This mom and this son were out at the Police Academy graduation uh, at Napa Valley College. I believe her husband was graduating as uh, an officer and while they were waiting for the ceremonies, they were playing a game of hands. <laughs> this is Bob. He's playing at uh, a, a Fairfield amusement park, one of those ones where you go in and you bounce a lot. And he's getting ready to sneak up on some folks. Same place, uh, they were playing table hockey. Uh, I think that's what it is. And I was struck by the, the contrast with the red and the machine and these young people having a wonderful time. Now, Manzanar is a subject that is of particular interest. It's one of those times in our history where the United States is and should be embarrassed. Uh, following the declaration of war by FDR against Japan upon the attack of Pearl Harbor, FDR issued Executive Order 9066, which provided for the roundup of over 120,000 Japanese Americans and put them in what essentially was concentration camps. There were 10 of these camps, one of which is Manzanar, and is being restored to a certain degree to show what it was like. Uh, 11,000 people were sent to Manzanar. Uh, over 200 died there. There was a little violence uh, created from conflicts with internal conflicts and conflicts with the guards. 
Uh, the eastern Sierras are in the background. You can see that it's high desert, and the compound itself was uh, a mile square and had, like I said, 11,000 inhabitants over four years. These folks had all of their possessions taken away. They had no time to make preparations. It was almost an overnight deal. And they broke, the government broke seven, at least seven of the 10 amendments of the Bill of Rights in doing it. They are listed here if you're interested in looking them up and, and seeing what this was all about. Sort of a theme piece. Now the instruct they have there's a monument built by Japanese Americans. The inscription reads, well, I can't read the whole thing because I've got some pictures over the top, but I think you can read it here. Give you a couple of minutes, seconds. And then that's the monument itself. You'll see uh, origami cranes along the posts and on the top of the shelf there. Mariko Yamada was the former California representative of District 4. Uh, she was not at Manzanar. She was too young, but her two sisters and her brother were. Irene and Marge and Arthur all were children and have memories that they shared with me. And I've been writing uh, some compositions uh, based on the interviews that I've given with her, with her them. Uh, Children of Manzanar is a book that has comments and commentary uh, by and about the children residents, one of whom happened to be Arthur Yamada, Mariko's brother. She didn't know he was in there. I discovered it in the bookstore and I told her about it and she rushed out and bought the book. And we were both pleasantly surprised with that, I think. Uh, yeah. Turkey vultures, how I learned to love them. I dated a young woman named Emily way, way, way back when, and she told me that she had an experience on Mount Shasta that a mysterious spirit woman told her that her name was, her spirit name was Buzzard Woman. Now, buzzards don't live in the United States. They live in Europe, but people call them buzzards incorrectly and buzzard woman actually sounds better than vulture woman. But it got me interested in, in turkey vultures. While pursuing that interest, I discovered the Turkey Vulture Festival in Kern County where I met Ali Sheehy, who at various times has, has been a moderator for uh, instruction and does bird walks and talks about turkey vultures. Uh, and knows just about everything about nature that I can imagine. Sequoia forest keeper. Now, I want you to look at this guy's nose, his beak. You can see through it. That is accountable to the fact that they have an extraordinary sense of smell. They can smell carrion from 5,000 feet high. Uh, which is good because then they get to go down and, and devour it and it helps prevent the spread of disease. They can eat something that is contaminated that would kill us and they will, their digestive system will purify it. They kill botulism inside themselves. It's amazing. Now, this is a forest canopy here is what the Kern River Preserve is partly about. The keepers are restoring cottonwood and willow trees that were taken out for water projects from the Kern River that goes, to, to, goes down to Los Angeles and destroyed all the uh, 
the riparian area and the biodiverse areas that the forest represents. Now all these turkey vultures in the air had landed for the night. And there's probably a uh, hundred here. Uh, something had startled them while I was shooting and three or 4,000 had risen and I could just get this one little chunk here. Uh, but you can see how many they are and, and they have a, each have a wing spread of about seven feet. So they're huge birds flying around. And they settled back down probably within 20 minutes, but uh, I never did find out what, what scared them. In the mornings, after they've spread their wings and they warm up, they get into the air and start finding thermals, heat thermals, and they rise in the heat thermals in a circular fashion. You've seen them in movies, uh, misrepresented in movies. Uh, this is called kettling. This is a kettle of turkey vultures, and they're rising to three to 5,000 feet, and they will break at some point and head off to the south on their migration path. There's actually two kettles here, the big one in foreground, and then down center and slightly to the left, there's another smaller one. Mm -hmm. And if you look real high to the right, uh, you'll see some that are all heading towards that mountain peak. They'll break off to the right a little bit and head south. We're facing sort of southeast at, the, at this point. There's a bunch here that are warming up for that flight. And the question is, is what do you do at a turkey festival, festival anyway? You share information. You instruct, you teach. Uh, young lady on the left is talking about tur uh, vultures in the old world, that is Europe and Africa, uh, which have different species than we have here in the new world. Bottom right, is Reed Tollefson, director or manager of the Kern River Preserve, and he's talking about the mission and the money that's necessary. They buy land and then they start to uh, rehab it in terms of the forest. It's a great program. One of the programs they do was uh, when I first went there in 2004, they had an insect expert who put up a sheet and a light in the middle of the night and all kinds of critters came in, including this praying mantis, uh, highlighted with the, his light and one of my favorite shots, actually. And again, more information, Sequoia Forest Keepers, that's where Allie works now. She didn't at this time, but they've been around a while and they keep try to keep uh, care of the Sequoia Forest, which is, has its problems uh, as many forests do in this climate change era. Uh, parents bring their kids and there's activities for them to share. Uh, it's a neat program. This fellow and his son are doing some sort of thing here. I'm not sure what. Manzanar again. Uh, these are Buddhist priests praying at, towards the end of the ceremonies of a program called Manzanar Pilgrimage. It's a, rec it's a, a ceremony and recognition of the, of the EO 9066 and what it represented for freedom in America and the political situation today they are identifying with heavily. Uh, this is a Christian minister who spoke, another Christian minister who spoke. The Muslim population has been coming in uh, to Manzanar more and more each year. And there's Tycho drummers. These are university, I think Southern California. They come every year, a different group because they're students and they move on to graduation. They are very exciting, they're very good, and they're a lot of fun to listen to. 
you can tell they're having a good time, I think. Towards the end of the ceremony, they do what's called Oban dancing. Uh, you see the folks in sort of a dance pose. Oban dancing is uh, something they do to drive away evil spirits and bring in good spirits, as I understand it. And it's a lot of fun. Uh, I have three left feet, so I don't try to participate, but it's fun to take their photos. They're building examples of how they had to live in Manzanar. This is a barracks that was reconstructed from uh, plans and photos. This is how they started out. No insulation, very cold winters, very hot summers, very dry summers. Over a period of time, they would rehab the buildings. Uh, the, the inmates themselves would rebuild furniture out of crates that were magnificent. They'd insulate them so that they were ha more habitable. Madeline Arai was a young woman who was with her family brought into Manzanar and to make it more homey, her dad built this pond and she remembered it, but it had been covered over. So she talked to some of the Manzanar people and gave her memories uh, sufficiently that they were able to relocate it and reconstruct it. In every pilgrimage, they crank up the water, uh, which has to be piped in. And for several years, she was there to talk about her experiences and about the pond. Uh, last year, not this year, but last year, uh, she was ill, so she didn't make it. Uh, and this year, of course, uh, the pilgrimage was canceled for a time and then done virtually. Uh, which was not the same thing. It was good that they did it, but it wasn't the same thing. That's Madeline Rye, uh, a charming woman. I, I really liked her. Uh, I hope she liked me. I finally got myself in front of the camera because I wanted a picture with her. Uh, the book that I'm holding is the book given to me by the researcher working for the uh, Manzanar. They had several copies and they gave me, a, it's a chronicle of the pond itself and her story. Now, uh, you can read that. I was going to be an astronomer at one point and I discovered high school chemistry and we didn't get along. So I changed to an English major, but I kept my interest in astronomy on a lay level. So I've been shooting some photos. I've been lucky on some of them. Gibbous is just past quarter. It's growing larger and it's more than half. You may remember Clavius from 2001, where the big obelisk was found. That's the crater right there. This is a total eclipse of the moon. There's a program called SLU Telescope, which you can rent. And this was taken with a 24 inch telescope that I had access to. Uh, it's the best moon lunar eclipse photo I've ever taken, I think because of the quality of that instrument. And even though it was remotely shot, I shot it. So it's mine. <laughs> I'm pretty proud of it. Uh, this is Orion. I don't know if you can make out the stars, but the little fuzzy thing at the bottom is Messier 42, of the Messier catalog. You've seen pictures of it uh, from Hubble. It's huge, it's beautiful. I got a little fuzzy dot here with my, my uh, time-lapse photo here. The star, the red star at the top left, that's the famous Betelgeuse, or Betelgeuse. It is scheduled to go supernova within the next million years. 
uh, we probably won't be around then. Astronomers assure us we'll be okay. Uh, it's far enough away, but it's going to take up this night sky brighter than the new moon, or full moon. My first sunspot pictures, uh, as you can see, 2003, they number some sunspots to keep records of them. Uh, there's a site online called Space Weather where you can get the condition of the sun any day of the week. Uh, this was shot with a, a Celestron telescope and a Canon 20D, I think. An annular eclipse, it's a little fuzzy because I had to take a picture of a picture to get this one to work. Uh, annular means that the moon passes in front of the sun, but does not completely block it out. Uh, like a, so, a total eclipse would. And I put these together to show the progression and the, the annular in the center. This is a photo, photos of Venus making a transition across the surface of the sun. This happens rarely. I got two sh opportunities to do it. This was the last one. And I had a, a whole bunch, uh, <coughs> pardon me, that show the transition, but this pretty much gives it. You'll see little dots all over it. Those are sunspots as well. Sunspots are cooler spots on the sun than the surface of the sun. And that's why they show up dark in contrast. Solar eclipse in 2017. I drove to Casper, Wyoming to take these. And this is the highlight of this total solarity. Uh, also to the right is the annular eclipse and to the left is the sun before the total eclipse, uh, showing the sunspots before they get blocked out. That's a little closer. You'll see at the top and at the right a little dent of orange. Uh, if I had the proper filters and telescope, those would be solar prominences uh, that would be shooting out from the sun hundreds of thousands of miles. Uh, sometimes they give rise to solar flares which come to the earth as high energy radiation and cause northern lights and southern lights. Aurora and Borealis. And I, what's the one for Southern Aurora? Anyway, uh, this is Sagittarius. You'll see the bright stars kind of form a, a teacup. A big bright thing is Mars. This is one of the photos that went into that big long panorama but this is just a single photo. I heightened the contrast a little bit and darkened it a little bit to get the stars to pop and kind of a blueness. It was actually darker than that, but uh, I think it works. Now I like to shoot entertainment. They're fun and exciting. There's a lot of entertainment in Napa, a lot of opportunity. Uh, Trevor Lyon, uh, he's got a friend who works at the library named Pep. Uh, this is a debut of uh, Mary Jensen, of her first jazz album, Silos, which is mostly closed now. I think they do special events. Uh, also at Silos, these jazz musicians were in company with a, a, another lady singer that I don't happen to have a photograph here in. Charlie Daniels, The Devil Down in Georgia. This was shot at the Town and Country Fair. I was not allowed to do this. So I took a telephoto lens from outside his guarded venue and took this shot just to show him that I can do it. <laughs> He's a great musician, great band, and a great hat. Uh, Napa Climate Now had a fundraiser. They pulled together these three ladies, the Soma Trio. This was a world premiere for them because they'd never played together before and they were spectacular. Yay. 
few years ago, there was a big fire up in Lake County before we had our recent wildfires. And this is at a vineyard called Dollar Hyde Vineyard owned by St. Supri. And they gave a special photographer's tour one year. This is at sunrise and all that red is smoke. Uh, the contrast was incredible. It changed the quality and the intensity of the photos of the vineyard itself, as well as this profile of trees in the sun. Mendocino, of course. And this young lady was jogging at sunset in Imperial Beach, California. The light is natural. I didn't do anything to it except up the contrast about 10, maybe 15%. Just incredible to me that it came out with that kind of coloring. That's it. No, it isn't. This is one of the uh, photos from that first Latino march. Another. That's it. Some more on the register march. These are at the end because I wasn't sure I would get to them. Yeah. That's it, folks. Do we have any questions? I'm not hearing you. Can you hear now? Yes. Yeah. So, okay, but, I think I'm unmuted now. So, what you can do if you have any questions for Richard, click on the icon at the, uh, click on participants, and then there will be an icon at the center of that screen, and it will allow you to see on the far right hand corner a, uh, a button where you can raise your hand. Does anybody have any questions? Raise your hand, we'll gladly take your questions. Am I unmuted? Yeah, I, it sounds like you are unmuted. Did you have a question? Just so, what are you in, most interested in now? And sounds like either things you do regularly year after year, and parts of the country and festivals. Uh, I do. Yeah, that's a good question. I do political events and music events that are in in, in the public. Uh, every summer and spring, uh, Napa provides music venues down at uh, Vets Memorial Park, and I love shooting down there. People have such a good time, and I like taking photos of people having a good time. And also, uh, profiles of musicians uh, doing their thing, like that photo of Trevor Lyon. I just love that. If you've ever heard him perform, his intensity is palpable and his music is his own. He writes it, he chore uh, mm. scores it and sings it. And he has his own unique style and it's fascinating to, to listen to. Uh, I like political events because they're important. They need to be documented. Uh, I've done the Tea Party. Uh, I've done several democratic uh, marches and protests and forums. Uh, I've done town halls. Uh, in the old days, in the 60s, I did a whole bunch of political stuff, but I had my film stolen. Uh, mm. and I had my apartment broken into a couple of times, and they took everything, uh, including a box of film and pictures. So mm. I lost those archives, which is um, mm. sad about. Uh, I like wildlife and I, I'm not mm -hmm. so spry as I used to be. So getting out there is a little more problematic than it used to be. Uh, some of the photos I'd take at Lassen Park, I would backpack into the wilderness alone. I can't do that anymore. My cardiologist says, don't do that. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe him. Um, Are there any other questions for Richard? I don't know. I don't oh, there's got to be a question out there. 
Um, well, I think we're, I think we're mesmerized by what you've said, Richard. You know, you gave a wonderful presentation. You know, it, it gave a wide spectrum of the types of, of photography that you do, and uh, and you had wonderful stories. Um, I, I think somebody is stop sh a screen sharing with Richard. I don't oh. know what that means. <laughs> this is Kathleen. Can you hear me? Kathleen, go ahead. <laughs> I couldn't see where I could raise my hand, but um, unfortunately, I had an unexpected phone call. I missed the first part of this. Is there a way I can see the uh, photographs, Richard? Well, we we are actually recording it, and, it, oh, and we will be we will be placing it on our library web, website, and then we will make it available to Richard, so Richard can also uh, place it on his website. Great, thank you. Uh huh. So, Richard, I have a question. Um, I'm really amazed at the wide variety of subjects that you make pictures of. And I'm wondering, do you have a different thought process when you say, for example, take a photograph of a great blue heron versus a, a protest? A thought process? Yeah. Uh, in the back of my mind, my thinking is to try to get good composition because the story that any given situation is telling can be tell uh, can be tell can be told better uh, if the composition of the photo is enhancing the story. Uh, I I shot a protest uh, last Sunday down on Main Street between. Vets Park and the, the uh, restaurants across the street. And Chief uh, Police Robert Plummer did a, a speech to the crowd. And I videoed that. And I there's a setting on there that allows you to take pictures while you're video videoing. And I tried to get him and the leaders and some of the protesters and some of the signs in those shots so that that one or two images would tell the whole story. Fortunately, he co cooperated. Uh, he's aware of the camera, I think. He's aware of the value of showing community who he is. And it helped that I was able to, to, to work, he was able to work with that. Uh, the thought process that I actually use is what I said at the beginning was make sure you take your camera with you. Uh, the number of times I've missed shots that I would love to have had because I didn't take a camera are, are so numerous that I'd have probably a, a twice as many photos as I have now if I'd done it. I do take a camera with me everywhere I go now. It's easier for a lot of people to do that because of the cell phone cameras. Uh, some folks are using them exclusively now because the quality of the imagery in some of them is so good that why lunk around a big heavy Nikon or Canon when you can pull out your iPhone or your Android and start shooting with that. And if you watch the news of some of these protests, you'll see everybody holding up their cell phone recording it. Uh, for their own purposes and for political purposes as well, I suppose. Does that answer? <laughs> it does, yeah, thank you. You're welcome. I'd like to ask a question. Go right ahead, Conchita. Hi, well, first of all, I wanna make just an observation. I've seen a lot of Richard's pictures of people and he, of course, we're involved politically, so he takes a lot of photos at the various things we go to. But what I love today, I mean, I love his pictures of people and the political aspect, but I just, I was, I was just telling my husband, it's so wonderful to see your nature photos. I just have enjoyed them so much. And the moon shots, there is such a huge diversity mm -hmm. in your picture taking that I never knew about. Mm -hmm. So I really am so, it's just, it's just been a great revelation and i wanted to thank you um you ha but your photos the nature photos are just wonderful and um I, I i love the one it's like where you had to i try to identify the deer 
my husband and I were like, where's the deer? Where are the two deer? It's all, kind of like when you're, when you have kids, you have, where's, Os, where's, what is it? Osvaldo or whatever his name was. It's like, where, where are the, where's the deer? So, Waldo. <laughs> Waldo. Thank you. Where's Waldo? <laughs> Um, the other thought, though, the, the other thing I did want to ask you about, Richard, is that I know you're always there with your larger cameras. Are you starting to take more pictures with a smartphone or with that? Because I know I used to walk around with, the, you know, with a larger picture. Then I went to point and shoot, which was smaller and you didn't have to fool around with, you know, fooling around with focus and all of that. And then finally, I'm now taking everything with... Um, my iPhone that my kids finally, they made, they said, mom, you have to get rid of, you know, your flip phone. You have to get a smartphone. And I finally did. And you're right. The, the camera is so beautiful. And I got one that was where you had both the regular lens and then uh, one, which is a closer lens, but are you doing stuff with your smartphone at all? Only if something's gone wrong with the other cameras. I have an Android and its photo mechanism uh, or its standard is not as high as some of the others. Um, its zoom is only uh, twice powerful. Uh, and I made the mistake of getting an Android instead of an iPhone. And the mistake is that I use a Mac Book Pro for my work and it won't accept photos. Mm -hmm easily from an Android. You have to get, what I have to do is email them to myself. And it's a pain in the keister. Uh, if I'd gotten an iPhone, the transfer had been very easy. Uh, also, the manipulation of the phone and pressing that little button, that virtual button, I'm not comfortable with that. I, I, I'm not it's not easy for me. So I still carry around my big stuff. Yeah. Besides, oh, they're beautiful. It cool. <laughs> it's just that the iPhone, like you say, has opened it up. So many people are just, you can take it anywhere. It's small, it's compact. But anyway, thank, but thank you so much for sharing this all today. It's been a revelation. The iPhones uh, are probably the standard in cell phone uh, photography, uh, especially the newer ones. Um, Ron Rogers could address that. He's, he uses that, and I think almost exclusively now. Uh, I'd like to think that I would, could do that, but I still like having the big camera. Any other questions? Well, that was wonderful, and you mentioned Ron Rogers, and he will be... Uh, um, he will be talking about some of his travels in another series that we do at the library in October, October 15th. That's on a Thursday night. Uh, Ron will be talking about uh, his, some of his journeys. Um, I, think it's, I think it's China, uh, Remarkable Journeys, uh, and that will be coming up shortly. And so he can maybe answer some of those questions. What kind of cameras he uses during that uh, while he's traveling and taking uh, photographs of his excursions. In the meantime, I really thank you all for being here. Richard, thank you so much for this wonderful enlightening program. It was awesome. Um, I want to remind everyone that we are here uh, for Art in the Library on the second Friday of the month. We will be here again next, uh, next month on July 10th at 6.30. We have an author who uh, was actually exhibiting earlier in the, in the year. Be things are a little bit kind of wonky because of the COVID-19. But his name, uh, the author's name is Gerald Huth. And he will be talking about the collage work that he does. And he used beautiful works of uh, paper that he comes and he gathers from all over the world to create his collage works. He's a Sonoma County artist and he will be exhibiting again next year in August 2021. He was uh, intended to exhibit in July, but that has been canceled because of COVID. Uh, anyway, I look forward to seeing you next month. Thank you very much, Richard, for your, your efforts and the time you put into this. And it was a beautiful, beautiful program. Thank you, and uh, Thank thanks you. for everybody showing up and, and your questions. Thank you, Richard. Thank Bravo. You. Thank you. Thank you, library. We love you, library. Thank, Thank you. you.